It's Poetry Month here at the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast and everywhere else too. And so we're going to take advantage of that fact and uh, use this opportunity to explore some wonderful new poems. Not new necessarily, but uh, new to the podcast. And I'm sure you'll enjoy them. And hopefully, if you're not already a huge fan and using poetry in your coaching, you will after today. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Hi there. Welcome back to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. I'm Doug O'Brien. It's April. It's April 2022 as I record this, and uh, it's Poetry Month. I don't know if you knew that. Probably you did, but it is Poetry Month whether you knew it or not. And if you didn't know it, now you know. It's Poetry Month, and I like poetry. I like poetry a lot, and I listen to it a lot on, you know, podcasts (laughs) podcasts <laughs> in various other places. And I also read it a lot. And I find it really valuable as a coach. There's something about it. I've said this before. I know you might have heard previous poetry podcasts, but this is another one um, from me. I like poetry a lot when it comes to coaching. There is something about putting words in verse that makes them much more powerful, you know, it's it's like the quote pattern in Ericksonian hypnotic language patterns. You know, if you can quote somebody, like Milton Erickson once said, if you can quote somebody, it makes it better. I don't think he said that, but he might have done. But you can attribute wise sayings to, you know, Erickson or your grandmother or whatever, and it comes across in a trance as being something that stands out and is important. Poems are the same way. If you really can find a poem that speaks to the issue that you're talking about with your client, then, oh my goodness, it has weight. It really does. It sticks with them. You know, there's a there's a wonderful book. Again, you've probably read it's about business. It's called, um, um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> maybe I should just start over. I can't remember what it's called. Something about sticking. It's it's about how you make things stick. It's got a picture of on the cover. It's got a picture of duct tape on the cover. And it's about making ideas stick. And one of the ways you make an idea stick, although I can't remember the title of the book, which is funny, ironic. I hope you see the humor in that. One of the ways you make things stick is that you have it stand out from the rest. It's like a quote or it's like a poem. It's special, right? It stands out. It sticks. So I'm going to start today's poetry sharing with a poem. Frankly, I do not know who it's by. Um, I I should know, but I don't. I saw it posted on Facebook and I liked it. So uh, I'm reading it. It says it's by SRW Poetry. I don't think that's a person's name. SRW is probably that person's initials. And I don't know who that person is, but the poem is very cool. I think you like it. It's called Sometimes the Wolf Cries Girl. Sometimes the hero stumbles and falls right off the page. Sometimes the princess rolls her eyes and says, I don't want to be saved. Sometimes the dragon needs rescuing and the villain aches to be helped. Sometimes in the darkness, the lost boy finds himself. Sometimes the prince is cunning and not at all what he seemed. Sometimes it's the witch's kindness shows it's she who deserves to be queen. Sometimes we shouldn't define people by someone else's point of view. Just because it's what we've been told doesn't make it true. I love that poem. I actually love that poem. I'm going to read it again. Before I do, though, I would like to point out that one of my favorite poems, poets, is a man named David White. If you've listened to this podcast, you've heard me speak of him, or perhaps you've listened to other poetry episodes from this podcast where I've read his poems. Um, David White is an Irish poet who lives in the United States. I think he, he has done. I think he still does. He lives out near Seattle and he's, he's taught poetry workshops all over the world, but for Boeing in Seattle, I think he's got an ongoing contract to do poetry 
poetry workshops for workers at Boeing, which of course, you know, creates, um, manufactures airplanes. Um, so I, I think that's fascinating that they would have a poet come in that, uh, teaches them poetry. He's a fascinating guy, a uh, very charismatic, very wonderful voice and a fabulous poet, David White, W H Y T E. And, um, one of the quirks I've noticed with David White is that when he reads poems, when he does a poetry reading, he often repeats lines before he's halfway done with the poem. He'll just, you know, re- read a couple you know, sentences and then they'll say them over again. He'll just repeat it over again. It's kind of weird, but it's obviously very effective, um, especially when you have it with that beautiful voice he has and that Irish accent that he has. It's very compelling. So I'm not going to read it like David White here. If I later read a David White poem, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll read it with his kind of way of doing it. But I'm just going to read the whole thing again because it, it bears repeating. I, I'm sure you, if you wanted to listen to it again, you could just back up the recording and listen to it again, but I'll save you the trouble. It's called Sometimes the Wolf Cries Girl by SRW Poetry. Sometimes the Wolf Cries Girl. Sometimes the hero stumbles and falls right off the page. Sometimes the princess rolls her eyes and says, I don't want to be saved. Sometimes the dragon needs rescuing and the villain aches to be helped. Sometimes in the darkness, the lost boy finds himself. Sometimes the prince is cunning and not at all what he seemed. Sometimes the witch's kindness shows that it's she who deserves to be queen. Sometimes we shouldn't define people by someone else's point of view. Just because it's what we've been told doesn't make it true. One of the other things I love about poetry is that it is, I think, so very similar to hypnosis. Particularly in Ericksonian hypnosis, we strive to create stories, to create scenarios, to create imagery that speak to the person so that you're not just telling them to do something. You're creating a a thought field environment where they, you know, can do it in their mind before they do it in reality. So that works really, really beautifully. And sometimes within that, you really find yourself searching for just the right word just the right turn of phrase. And, of course, when you speak poetry, when you speak a trance induction if we're in a coaching session, the way you say the words are just as important, if not perhaps more important, arguably more important than the word choices themselves. It's both, of course. Saying the right words in the right way is what really makes the difference. So much of what I think of as um, beautiful, effective imagery in a trance and the pacing and the cadence with which a a good hypnotherapist will say those words is very, very similar to poetry. This um, following poem is by a woman named Julie Flanders, who is not only beautiful and award-winning poet, um, she's also a lyricist write songs for a, a band of which she also sings called October Project. And uh, is also a hypnotherapist and coach. So she's all of that and more. So this is a song that, uh, no, I'm sorry, a poem uh, that she wrote that is uh, called Just Waves. And I think it doubles kind of, in my mind at least, it doubles as kind of a trance induction and a poem at the same time. See if you agree. Just Waves. Sometimes it hides in the strange hum of the refrigerator, stopping for a moment. Sometimes it is in the unexpected laugh from the hallway or the rush of voices from the street. The music finds itself in the silence. Silence holds the bones of it, the sense and meaning of all those sound and unsound reverberations that pretend to make sense. Without silence, they are noise. 
non-events. In this imaginary place where silence moves, dense and light, beyond time and space, there is a sudden break. Not thought, just hearing, feeling, seeing, free to just be one with the hum. Now, I would like to just say, another thing we do in Ericksonian hypnosis, at least the way that I I understand it and present it when I teach my classes in neo-Ericksonian hypnosis, is that we pay attention to the client's breathing. And that one of the ways we have deep rapport with our clients and also create a rhythm and create a context for really beautiful transinduction verbiage is that we speak in rhythm to the client's breathing. Primarily, we notice the breathing and we endeavor to speak only on the client's exhalation. As the client exhales, we speak. When the client inhales, we fall silent. This obviously creates a rhythm and it has a lot of silence because people breathe in kind of equal inhales and exhales. And so uh, this poem, as you heard it, has a lot of talking about silence, doesn't it? So I'm going to read it again. And I'm going to take maybe a little bit more time for the silence. I probably won't take as much as I would if it were a true trance induction, but I will take more silence than it did the first time. See what you think. See if it affects you differently to hear more silence, as in the paying attention to the exhalation of the client in a hypnosis session. Does this feel more hypnotic to you or not? Maybe this is something you can do the next time you're doing a trance induction with someone. Pay attention to their breathing and speak on the exhalation. Just Waves by Julie Flanders. Sometimes it hides in the strange hum of the refrigerator, stopping for a moment. Sometimes It is the unexpected laugh from the hallway or the rush of voices from the street. The music finds itself in the silence. Silence holds the bones of it the sense and meaning of all those sound and unsound reverberations that pretend to make sense. Without silence, they are noise, non-events. In this imaginary place where silence moves, dense and light, beyond time and space, there is a sudden break. Not thought, just hearing. Feeling, seeing, free to just be one with the hum. What do you think? Different? Definitely different. Better? Worse? More trancy? I don't know. Interesting to, to experiment, isn't it? to play with different possible ways of doing things like that. 
It's like practicing a play or practicing music. It's good to practice the way you say what you're going to be saying to clients. Now, one of the other ways you can use poetry as a coach is not necessarily in an individual coaching session, but sometimes if you're doing a a group, if you're teaching a class, if you're conducting a group coaching session, that you can read a poem to the group and that serves as a way that everyone can kind of, you know, anchor together and set a theme and a way of thinking that's useful for the group that you're leading. Um, I've heard the poet Rumi's work a great deal for this exact same sort of thing, that people read a poem in a group setting because they're so beautiful, such beautiful poems and so universal in their kind of experience of the poetry. This is a poem that uh, sort of speaks to me as a musician, as a, somebody who's paid attention a lot to the sounds and the rhythm and the cadence and the silences. This is a poem by Rumi called Where Everything is Music. Don't worry about saving these songs. And if one of our instrument breaks, doesn't matter. We have fallen into the place where everything is music. The strumming and the flute notes rise into the atmosphere, and even if the whole world's harp should burn up, there will still be hidden instruments playing. So the candle flickers and goes out. We have a piece of flint and a spark. The singing art is sea foam. The graceful movements come from a pearl somewhere on the ocean floor. Poems reach like spindrift in the edge of driftwood along the beach, wanting. They derive from a slow and painful root that we can't see. Stop the words now. Open the window in the center of your chest and let the spirits fly in and out. That is where everything is music by the poet Rumi. The next poem I'd like to read to you is called The Bagel by David Ignato. It's from his collection Against the Evidence. And I particularly like this poem for a variety of reasons. I I just think it's wonderful. But I I, I particularly like it. The reason I want to share it with you today is that I heard it first on the Writer's Almanac, uh, which is a daily program that used to be broadcast on National Public Radio. It's put out by Garrison Keillor. It is still happening, at least for now. I know he's getting old, and I heard he was going to retire at the end of the month. I thought it was last month, but he's still putting these out once a day, called the Writer's Almanac. And you can still find them, at least for now, uh, if you go to Google and search for the Writer's Almanac. It might be thewritersalmanac.com, but it probably is. don't want to say that definitively, but it it probably is. You can find it. Great stuff, just great stuff there. It's always such a great way to start the day. And uh, if you are interested in poetry, it's a great source of new stuff. One of the reasons I love this poem, besides the fact that it comes from Garrison Keillor, who I have great admiration for as a storyteller and, you know, general human being, is, um, is that this, this poem is, is about a, a man who's walking down the street, drops a bagel, and well, you'll hear the poem. But I, I love how he, um, you know, kind of copes with this situation. Quick story as an aside. Um, my wife and I were walking home one day down uh, first street in, in Brooklyn before, before COVID changed our lives. And we moved up to our little cabin in the woods. Um, that's we're not in the woods uh, in the rural area. And um, these two little kids were racing up the street. Uh, it's up because it's park slope. It has a slope up to the park. And, um, one, the boy's a little older, a little taller, at least than the girl, probably older. And, um, the little girl was slower and sh- shorter. And, but, uh, they were racing themselves at each other anyway. And, um, they got to right near us where there was an imaginary finish line. And the little boy, you know, throws his hand over the air and goes, I win. And about two seconds later, the little girl gets to the same imaginary finish line and throws her hands up in the air and goes, I lose. <laughs> I just thought it was great. My wife and I just looked at each other. And we're like, what? That's great. It's a game. Everyone wins. And so I just thought that was fantastic. And it just reminds me a little bit of this poem, The Bagel 
by David Ignato from his uh, book Against the Evidence. I stopped to pick up the bagel, rolling away in the wind, annoyed with myself for having dropped it, as if it were a portent. Faster and faster it rolled, with me running after it, bent low, gritting my teeth, and I found myself doubled over and rolling down the street, head over heels, one complete somersault after another like a bagel, and strangely happy with myself. That's the bagel by David. I love that imagery. And that's just a great attitude, you know. I win. I lose. Brilliant. For my next poem, I'd like to read one of my favorite poems by David White. You know, it's interesting. When I read this poem, I usually stop. I usually read this in a seminar setting or in a coaching setting. So I, I, I read parts of it. I don't read the entire poem. Um, today I will read the entire poem. And, and because it is by David White, and I told you the way he reads it, I will do what he does and stop and repeat myself. I don't know if I'll do it exactly. I don't know if he ever knows where he's going to stop and repeat himself. But he does do it, and it's kind of cool, and I'm, I'm going to do it. So be aware that the poem, when it repeats itself, it's because I'm repeating. It's not actually written that way. It's just written once and then, anyway. This is called What to Remember When Waking by David White from his book, The House of Belonging. And I have it from a published quartet of books called A Quartet by David White. What to Remember When Waking. In that first hardly noticed moment in which you wake, coming back to this life from the other more secret movable and frighteningly honest world where everything began. In that first, hardly noticed moment in which you wake, coming back to this life from the other, more secret, movable and frighteningly honest world where everything began, there is a small opening into the new day, which closes the moment you begin your plans. What you can plan is too small for you to live. What you can plan is too small for you to live. What you can live wholeheartedly will make plans enough for the vitality hidden in your sleep. To be human is to become visible while carrying what is hidden as a gift to others. To be human is to become visible while carrying what is hidden as a gift to others. To remember the other world in this world, is to live in your true inheritance. You are not a troubled guest on this earth. You are not an accident amidst other accidents. You were invited from another and greater night than the one from which you have just emerged. You are not a troubled guest on this earth. You are not an accident amidst other accidents. You were invited from another and greater night than the one from which you have just emerged. Now, looking through the slanting light of the morning window toward the mountain presence of everything that can be, what urgency calls you to your one love? What shape waits in the seed of you to grow and spread its branches against a future sky? Is it waiting in the fertile sea? in the trees beyond the house, in the life you can imagine for yourself, in the open and lovely white page on the waiting desk. So I believe I will leave it there for our poetry episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. I do hope that you've enjoyed this. I do hope that you will be inspired, if you're not already, to investigate what poems speak to you and how you can use them in your practice. I guarantee you it has an impact, especially if you can memorize things. There are a few poems I have memorized. I've shared those with you before. I won't do it for you now, but um, like The Road Less Traveled by Robert Frost, I have committed to memory. I've got some E.E. E. Cummings poems committed to memory. So when you can do that, it makes you sound really smart. And it sounds like what you're saying is truly profound. You know, like if you can quote Shakespeare, 
like the old song, brush up your Shakespeare, start quoting him now. You know, it just makes you sound smart. But more than that, it carries the message across in a way that sticks. And you want to have your message stick. Thank you. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want any more information about today's show, please visit our website at www.essentialcoachingskills.com. Be sure to tune in again next week for our next episode and discover even more about the systems and the secrets that set the best apart.